Hey YouTube, welcome back to the Crazy Cycling Channel and episode 10 of my Fairlight Ferran bike building series. In the last video, I built the wheels. Check them out. I think they look really, really good and they are nice and true. So now it's time to move on to the brakes. So today I'm going to be mounting the disc brake rotors and then I'm going to be uh, centering the disc brake calipers around the rotors. And when I put the calipers together, now when I squeeze the brakes, the piston only seems to come out from one side of the caliper. I'm not sure if that's because they're not bled enough or if there's something else going on or if that will adjust itself once there's a disc rotor in there. Um, so that's something I need to figure out. Um, and that's pretty much it. But before I get started, uh, one of you guys told me that I should put some grease or um, carbon assembly compound or something anti-seize on the uh, uh, seat post. And, um, you know, I kind of stand corrected on this. I thought that you shouldn't really do this. I've used grease before and it was a horrible mess, even if you just get a really thin coat on the seat post. I personally think that that is just a bad idea. I think it makes a horrible mess. Um, but if you have dissimilar metals, you get these galvanic reactions um, and that can cause your seat post to get seized in the frame. And I've actually had a seized seat post before, um, so I actually really don't want that. Uh, so I'm going to um, do something about that. I think I did a lot of research on this and it's another one of those things where you get different opinions, but I think the fact that these are dissimilar metals means that it would really make sense. So the question of course is what do you use? Should you use grease or a carbon assembly compound or anti seize And um, like I said, I don't really like grease. I don't have carbon assembly compound. I'm not really sure what it is. I know you need it for carbon fiber bikes to help the parts grip together because you shouldn't over torque carbon fiber components. Um, but I'm sure there's some corrosion protection stuff in there as well. I think carbon fiber can weirdly corrode with like aluminum as well. Um, but I'm going to use anti seize. So I've got this uh, Fenwick's copper anti seize compound. There's a lot of different brands of this stuff. Um, I use it all the time. It's kind of expensive, but it's well worth it. And you don't use that much of it. There's also aluminum anti seize And I always thought that was kind of the same thing. But when I was researching the seat post, the aluminum anti seize has aluminum in it. And apparently you can't use that to protect aluminum, which is kind of logical. So you should use probably the copper stuff, but that's what I'm going to do. So let me go ahead and get the uh, seat post out with whatever size Allen key that is at probably a four millimeter. And yeah, then we'll put some anti seize on the seat post. I don't know if it's best to put it on the seat post or inside the seat tube. Another thing that you get really opinionated people on forums online who say you have to do this, you have to do that. But a lot of these things aren't really then described. So I don't know if that's people who don't really know what they're talking about or just that the information is in their heads or in a book somewhere and just not on the internet. I don't really know. Um, but anyway, let's go ahead and take this here uh, seat post out. Yep, four millimeter. Shoot. Don't want to do that. Um, yeah. And that's actually kind of hard to get out of there. It's not seized or anything, but it's a very tight fit. Um, so yeah, let's go ahead and put some anti seize on the seat post. Okay, so what I've decided to do is I'm going to put a bead of this stuff inside of the top of the seat tube. And then I'll cover the seat post up to about where it was inside the frame and then wipe most of that off. So there's kind of a thin coat, but not too thin because another thing about this is that you start reading about this on the forums and then you see people who say, oh, I use anti seize but my seat post got stuck anyway. So that's just another whole can of worms. Um, but I'm going to just put some on the inside of there. And I think I'm going to go for a fairly thick coating. I like anti seize because it's not at all messy. It really... It really isn't. It barely feels oily um, and it just, the copper particles kind of stay in place as the oil washes away, I guess. With grease, you just have grease everywhere. And if you have exposed grease, even a thin layer, it's gonna attract all kind of dirt. And if you touch your seat post then, you get grease everywhere. It's horrible. Um, but the anti seize really isn't that much of a problem. So let's see, how can I do this? Um, 
I was going to use my finger, but it probably shouldn't. Let's just try and... Oh, I can do that, yeah. Yeah, I'll just kind of run a bead around the inside here. Right, that's a pretty thick bead on the uh, seat tube. And now let's get some on the seat post as well. All right, I'm probably going to start off with a thin coating, and I can always add more. So, yeah, I'm not really sure how to do this. The seat post was into the bike about till there, I think. So maybe I'll just spread some kind of like that and then just uh, wipe it around with a rag, I guess. Or I, I probably would use my fingers normally, but I mess my hands up a lot, use like touching grease and stuff, and it's probably not a good idea. So let's see. Of course, now I'm probably going to lose it into the rag. You know, I think I need more. That's kind of a, well, that's a pretty liberal coat. Let's see if I can spread that out. I mean, I can see it on there. That's pretty thin. Um, yeah, let's just go with some more. I really don't know how much to use, but I think any is probably better than none. I don't want to go too much. Let's do another similar sort of bead to last time. Um, and yeah. Um, yeah, now the whole seat um, post um, is just kind of covered with copper. And I mean, you feel it a little bit. It feels kind of like hand cream or something. It's, it kind of gets absorbed. Maybe it's not good for you, but um, it's, it's almost gone already on my fingers. I don't really feel it anymore. Whereas grease, you just feel it and feel it and feel it until you wash your hands with some kind of really strong soap. But that's just not how anti-seize is, at least the stuff I have. Maybe some other kind of anti-seize is different. Because when I was reading about this, people said use this stuff called copper slip. And they said that it's really sticky. This isn't really, so I don't know. But anyway, um, let's go ahead and put the seat back in the bike, I guess. And yeah. Certainly slips in really easily. Um, and yeah, I don't know exactly how high this needs to be. Let's slip it in a little bit more. And I'll just kind of snug it up for now. Um, Cause once I fit the bike to myself or find out that the frame doesn't fit me, which would not be good. Um, I'm kind of leaving that as a surprise. I mean, I could put my gravel wheels into this bike um, and try it that way. I don't have the tires or anything, but I'm already into this build. So no matter what, I'm going to finish the bike. So I'll just leave that till the end. And I really hope it fits me, but it should. But yeah, let's just snug that down a little bit. Not too much. That actually moves. See, this is one concern is that your seat will then move. So let's snug that down more. Um, yeah, that's still moving in there. So and I don't want to go crazy. That's now tight. There is a torque spec on that thing, but I don't know what it is. So I'm going to leave it at that for now. And eventually I'll have to come back and get all the bolts tightened properly. I haven't really done that, but um, yeah, got some anti-seize that you can just see a little bit on the top of the seat post there, but hopefully that will protect this from seizing together. And if one of you guys knows more about exactly how to do this, let me know. Um, and yeah, now let's move on to, to the brakes. Okay, so the rotors I've gone for are these Shimano rotors. I'm not quite sure what, what model they are, um, but they look pretty cool. They have this sort of four pronged uh, mount thing here. They were kind of expensive rotors. They're like mid to high range Shimano rotors. Um, they have their ice tech freeze ice technology thing, which basically means there is an aluminum carrier here and then you have the uh, steel disc on the outside and that helps with heat dissipation. I've got the same thing on my other bike and I actually think that makes a big difference. And with this bike, I wanted good brakes. That was, it's my pet peeve when your brakes don't work. I want really powerful brakes and I'd rather be able to modulate that a bit with the levers than have some uh, wimpy brakes that aren't gonna stop the bike. You know, if I could lift the back wheel off the ground, that'd be sweet, but I'm not sure I'll be able to. The max brake rotor size on this bike is 160 millimeters, and then it will take 140 millimeters as well. The brake mounts are flat mounts. So I have flat mount 
calipers. That's in contrast to post mount, which is the main style for mountain bikes. Um, and I think that that 160 limit is a limit of the flat mount standard more than the frame, but it's in the frame specification that 160 millimeters is the max rotor size. So I'm not too sure, but to give myself the best chance of, well, just the best brakes, I decided to go with um, sintered pads, which are a metallic kind of a compound, basically like what's on car brake, brake, brake calipers, brake, brake um, pads. And those have better stopping power, but the brakes don't feel as nice. And also they will squeak when they get wet. And this is really bad. My gravel bike now has that. And in all my videos, I'm always constantly trying to work around the brakes because they're always squeaking. Um, but so the other alternative is organic pads. And when I first got into biking more, I kind of thought organic was the best. The biggest problem with organic is the durability. And I noticed that when I was doing Deliveroo, the organic pads on my gravel bike would sometimes only last a couple weeks. I guess I was riding a lot, but they would only last a couple weeks and then just be burned out completely. So if you ride in the wet and you use organic pads, you can just burn your pads up like it's nothing and they're not exactly cheap. So I wanted to go with the um, sintered pads. Um, you know, the squeaking kind of gave me kind of second thoughts, but I think durability is the primary concern here. Thing with sintered pads is not every brake rotor can take sintered pads. They're much harsher with a, uh, sorry, yeah, with sintered pads. With organic pads, you basically have some kind of material that's just rubbing against the um, brake rotor and wearing away. With sintered pads, those materials are binding together. So you need to break, break in your brakes more and that causes material to be transferred from the pads to the rotor and vice versa. Like metallic particles will become embedded within this material and it will be much harsher on the brake disc. So you need a brake disc that's compatible with sintered pads. And a lot of cheap rotors, a lot of the cheap rotors aren't. Um, so if you're wanting to do or uh, sintered pads, you kind of want to look for that. But those are some of the considerations I had when I was going for brakes. If you watched my last video, you know that the calipers are Hope RX4 Plus which is not exactly a cheap caliper. Although in the grand scheme of types of bike components, brakes aren't really that expensive. Uh, I think they were, I got them in the UK and they were like 70 pounds each. So that's about a hundred dollars each. Um, I mean, which is clearly a lot, but um, you know, considering what you can spend on components, I kind of thought it was worth it. It's the one place I kind of spent money on this bike. Everything else I kind of did on the cheap, despite the fact that it's obviously a um, pretty expensive frame. Um, but with the brakes, I kind of wanted to spend money. But then to save on that, I got a Shimano GRX um, brake levers, but they are 10 speed levers because I'm only using that for the brakes. And they uh, were a lot less expensive than a lot of the other options out there. Um, but yeah, that's kind of the brake system. That's some of my thoughts. I don't know if that makes sense, but it made sense in my mind. Um, but yeah, anyway, time to get these on the bike. That's a lot of theory. Let's go ahead and get the wheels off. That is the first step. It's a six millimeter Allen key. As I found out in the last video, uh, you have a screw on that side on the non-drive side of the bike. You also have a hex fitting on the drive side. But what I didn't really get my mind around last time is that obviously if you're unscrewing from the drive side, you want to turn everything clockwise, which is backwards to normal to get the through axles out. So that's what I'm going to do and then get everything on the table and then let's start installing disc brakes. Okay, this is the front wheel and here is the brake disc. Let's get that out of the packaging. Um, I don't want to obviously touch the brake disc with my hands because I'll get grease all over it uh, or at least oils from my finger. So I'm going to try and avoid doing that. Whoops. Um, yeah, let's just use this rag. This is a clean rag. And there we go. That's the brake disc. Again, not really sure what model it is. Does it say it on there? RT MT800. So that's the brake disc model I've got. And that just fits on there like that. Center lock standard here. Now the question is, from an aesthetic point of view, <laughs> do I want to line up that text with the valve hole? Maybe I should. Maybe I'll line up the Shimano right there with the valve hole, which is there. 
It's about like that. Sure, let's do that. I'll just do that on the other side. Let me just see, is that, is that right? Not quite, maybe, maybe like that. <laughs> it's offset, it's not, I don't think that's quite right. But that's pretty close. You know, if it's not quite right, that's kind of a weird oversight on Shimano's part, because I know people get obsessed with how things look. I, I do too, to be honest. Um, but that doesn't look quite centered to me. Does that look centered to you? That point in between those two spokes? Or should it be like that? That's really wrong. I think it needs to be like, like so, right? I don't know if that's quite centered right or not. Um, but yeah, now all I need to do is install the um, lock ring, which is included. Um, and this particular one uses a, a cassette tool, which is here. Some of these lock rings also use bottom bracket tools, which I have somewhere around here. Um, can't find that right now, but anyway, these ones use a cassette tool. And that is a positive in my opinion, because it means that I'm using the same tool for the, this lock ring, as well as the lock ring of my cassette. And maybe I'd consider taking that with me if I was going on tour somewhere. Um, so yeah, and then obviously we have a torque standard here, 40 Newton meters. And I'm also gonna put some anti-seize on the lock ring, but I don't have a torque wrench here, so I need to go get it real quick. And then we'll go ahead and install that ring. Okay, let's go ahead and start the lock ring. Thing with these torque specifications is that my understanding is that that applies to a dry fastener. And if you put anti-seize on, obviously that will lubricate this to a certain extent. Uh, so I would say if you're not quite at 40, that is probably fine, but I'll just go ahead and put a little bit of this all along the threads, trying not to make a mess. I don't think you need to go too crazy with this. Cause this stuff is really good at basically finding where it needs to go. But, uh, yeah, there we go. Now. Let's start threading that. Perfect. And then the cassette tool is a Park FR 5.2. Other brands make these tools as well. I don't know if all cassettes use that tool, but Shimano cassettes do, and so do SRAM cassettes. Um, but yeah, let's kind of tighten that just with my fingers. And then we'll set our torque wrench. Of course, you don't need to use a torque wrench, but it's probably good practice for something like this. And the thing is 40 Newton meters is less than you think, at least less than I think. So let me see, I don't know if you can see that, but this side here says Newton meters. So I'm gonna set this torque wrench to 40, if I can find 40 on the scale. There's a 37 and a 44. I'll kind of go halfway between, maybe closer to the 37. And then these park tools take a one inch socket because they're an American company, which is kind of weird because everything on a bike is metric. So I kind of feel like they should use a metric size. There is a metric size that you can use. I can't remember what it is. It's like 27 millimeters or something. Uh, but yeah, now let's just go ahead and tighten that without dropping anything and without scratching anything and that you can see it. And with this kind of torque wrench, you just tighten until it clicks, which is there. Double check, and that did not take much effort at all. Obviously this is a long lever here, um, but 40 Newton meters is a lot less than I personally think. So yeah, that's just something to keep in mind. Um, if you want a cheaper torque wrench, you can get beam type torque wrench. They used to have one. I don't know what happened to it. I think I gave it away or something. Um, but those are kind of better because these ones supposedly need calibration. Uh, but anyway, if you use a torque, that's up to you whether or not you use a torque wrench. Uh, but yeah, that's the brake disc installed. I'm gonna do the back now. It's the exact same procedure. I'll line it up with Shimano pointing to up, torque it up with some anti-seize and the torque wrench. And then we'll install all the stuff onto the bike. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and reinstall the front wheel now, but there are some spacer blocks installed into the 
brake caliper, and those are there to prevent you from squeezing the brake lever uh, without a wheel in place because that could cause your pistons to completely fall out of the caliper and then you'll have a mess, fluid everywhere. Um, so that's why you typically put these blocks in there. Actually, they're bleed blocks as well in this case. Anyway, I need to get them out of the way. I think it's a two and a half millimeter Allen key. Nope, it's a bigger one. Uh, maybe it's the three millimeter. Yep. They're just basically two little um, aluminum blocks and I think they are bleed blocks technically and they just help keep the, um, the travel of the uh, brake lever properly set as you're bleeding the brakes. Um, but anyway, going to get them out of the way and now I have a tool that I actually like very much. It's kind of a specialized tool. It's a Park PP-1.2. It's a piston press and what that's good for is that is good for pressing the brake pistons out as far as they'll go. Actually, I forgot to put brake pads in, so I need to get the pads, but I need to press the um, pistons out of the way first anyway, um, because these brake pistons are, are, I guess my understanding is kind of self um, adjusting, but when you first install the wheel, you just want everything pressed outward as far as possible. And a tool like this is really good because it prevents you from cracking anything because this is a nice a wide surface here and it's also nice and thick. Uh, so it's one of those tools that I've thought of getting rid of before because it's kind of a thing you can only use to do this with, but uh, it's kind of made for it and it works very well. It's not even that expensive. You could use a screwdriver if you're careful or something like that, but um, like people like Park Tool don't recommend you do that. But anyway, I'm just gonna press, whoops, my uh, brake calipers aren't really installed properly, so the whole caliper just shifted. But I'm just gonna move the calipers out. So what's happening here is as I move the pistons on one side, the pistons on the other side are moving back out again or moving back in again. Uh, so I'm kind of thinking maybe the front brake system is overfilled is kind of what I'm thinking now, but I'll probably try and install the wheel and see whether or not it rubs. But I'm gonna try and get these, all these pistons sort of out as much as possible and then kind of centered as much as possible. That's kind of the plan now. You know, I'm almost positive I'll have to bleed this again because one of the pistons on your side of the bike isn't moving at all, but all the other ones are kind of moving as I move the other pistons around. So I just think, you know, I'm not an expert on this, but I just think there's something going on with air in here or something. But I'm gonna go ahead and install the wheel anyway. I can see that I'm gonna start having some problems here. I thought this would be really simple, but um, yeah, let me find the brake pads first of all, because I don't even know where they are and install them and then we'll get the front wheel installed and then just see what the brake does. Okay. So the problems are definitely starting here. Hopefully this is what makes these videos interesting. I found the brake pads. Each caliper comes with a set of blue pads and a set of red pads. And I'm not quite sure what the difference is. Uh, I thought one would be a sintered and one would be an organic, but they look very, very similar. And there's not much information after a quick search online, another one of those things. But one form said that the red is the road grade pad and the blue is the mountain bike pad. And another, I think I also did read that the red is organic and the blue is sintered, but Incidentally, while I was researching on the forums, there were a quite a few, pe few people who said that Hope Sintered pads are not very good, but their organic pads are very good. But then I read a contradictory forum post somewhere else that said that their Sintered pads are very good. And now I'm just not really sure what to go for. Uh, and I'm still not sure. Uh, <laughs> I think I need to go think about this a bit. I was gonna go straight to the Sintered pads. Um, but the thing with center pads is once you've used center pads on your rotors, you can't really go back because like I said, the center pads kind of get embedded, the metals get embedded with each other, but the life expectancy of the center pads really attracts me to them. Aside from that, I don't really like the center pads. Um, but then I was thinking when I'm cycle touring, how much am I going to be cycling in the rain? I mean, if it's raining and I'm cycle touring, 
and I don't have to be in the rain, I'm probably going to go sit under a tree or something unless I'm in a monsoon. So maybe we'll go with the red and I can always change to the blue later. Okay, decided. So let's put the, let's install the red pads. I'm trying not to touch the braking surface here either because I don't want to get any oils obviously onto the brake surface. Um, and now I just realized I forgot the spring over there. So I need to get the spring and then we can finally install the pads. Okay, so everything is good to go. And I just really think I'm gonna have a problem here with the way this caliper is set up, but let's give this a go. So I'm just gonna put everything together with a spring. Try not to drop anything here. And um, let's see if I can do it from the top. The uh, ends of the um, pads kind of look like little fish. Yeah, and I'm not really lined up. Right. Let's see. There we go. Uh, this one. You know what? I'm gonna put some anti seize on that as well. I have had these things seized. One of my early videos was about uh, getting out a seized um, brake caliper retaining clip uh, pin. So I'm gonna just score a little bit onto the threads and then the action of screwing this in place will kind of distribute that. Maybe I'll do it in and out a couple times. And there should be a little clip that goes through the end as well. There's even a hole for it. I might have lost that too. I hope not. Uh, I think it's in the bag of brake parts I have. Anyway, I'll deal with that in a sec. Now, let me get the piston press again. Here it is. And just try and push those pads apart again because they're very close together right now. I would say too close. And now I'm just going to try and put the wheel in and, and see what happens. I'm just worried now that I won't be able to tell if some of those pistons aren't moving properly. These are four piston calipers. And say if two of the pistons are working and two aren't, how would I know, right? Unless there's air in there and the air would compress and maybe I'd know that way. Um, but anyway... Baby steps, I can figure that all out later as well. And yeah, that rotor, I mean that, that um, caliper is totally not anywhere near centered around the brake rotor. Maybe I'll just switch the camera angle and kind of show you what I'm working with here right now. Right, so I don't know if you can see this very well, but this brake rotor is contacting the pads on that side of the brake caliper. And in fact, if I try and turn the wheel, you can hear that it's just rubbing pretty badly. And I tried kind of centering this visually but the gap between the pads just literally isn't big enough. So I think that I have too much uh, brake fluid here inside the whole braking system. And I'm gonna try and figure out how to get a little bit out. I think the, all you have to do really is open up the brake line up at the uh, brake lever end and then use the piston press to kind of push those pistons into place. And that will just push a little bit of the fluid out at the top. But I don't want to mess this up too much, so I'm going to do a bit of research first and then I'll come and talk to you guys and I'm probably just going to end up uh, bleeding the whole brake system again before I install this wheel, but this is kind of where I'm at now. Um, yeah, I need to figure out what's going on with the calipers, I think, before I can finish installing the actual wheel. Okay, so I did a bit of searching and kind of confirmed that it's most likely that this caliper is overfilled but in addition, um, I notice now if I just squeeze this lever gently, you don't want to do this too much. 
basically the top two pistons kind of come out evenly. The bottom one that's on my side of the bike comes out a little bit. And the bottom one on that side of the bike doesn't come out at all. And to me, that means that there is probably some air in the system. So I'm gonna try and bleed this again right now, but I'm just gonna do a bit of a gravity bleed and just kind of see what happens if I attach the bleed funnel here, open up this bleed port and just let a bit of fluid come through the system. Let me push the um, pistons out again. You just wanna be very careful that you don't Uh, squeeze the brake lever too much when you don't have any bleed blocks in there. Um, but yeah, let's just turn this and this is a bit like deja vu and I'm a bit frazzled because I can't find all the stuff I'm looking for because I put it all away because I thought I was done with this even though I knew I wasn't. So I don't know what I was thinking. I cleaned, I decided to clean one day, made a mess. I mean, it, it didn't make a mess, but now I don't know where anything is. Um, but I'm going to, I don't even know which funnel is the right one. I have two there, but I'm just going to take off that little screw thing. Oh, there's a bunch of fluid that already just leaked out. Um, but I do need to bleed this. Otherwise I'd say, let me just try it again, but I do need to bleed this because that isn't working right. So let's get a funnel on here. I have two of these, one is for mountain bikes. I think it's this one, is it? I suppose the problem is, I'm gonna get air back through the system again, aren't I? Oh, this could just, this could just be a mess. This isn't really orthodox brake bleeding, but let's see if I just run a little bit through the system, um, if, if some air will come out. Actually, I'll raise this whole stand up. Actually, I can't really do that. Can you guys see that? Kind of. All right. Let's put a little bit of oil. I don't, I also only have this much oil. So it, it's kind of precious. I'll just put a little bit in. Uh, let's open the funnel. And I'm just going to open up that bleed port just very slightly. Um, and just let some fluid kind of bleed out of there. Maybe I will just raise the bike up quick just so I have access and you can see what I'm doing. Right, got myself a rag just to catch any leakages. Let's see what, what happens if I open up that bleed port. Oh, fluid just starts gushing out of there. <laughs> yeah, that kind of made a mess. Um, the reason I'm doing the gravity bleed is because I don't know where the syringes are. So let me just leave it like that. Well, I think I, just, I'm, I think I'm sucking fluid and doing that. All right, let's just let this drip for a few minutes. It's hard to tell if there's any air coming out of here because, you know, I should, actually I can't. I need to find those, I need to find those syringes actually. Um, Shit. <laughs> I think I caught that in time. All right, let's close this. This is not how to bleed your brakes. It was really running out of there. And like I said, this fluid is kind of precious. So what's here is what I have. And if I run out, I'll be screwed. All right, I'm gonna put the bleed blocks in because I'm gonna start squeezing the brake lever and I don't want those um, pistons to get messed up. It's just so weird that there's one piston there that's not moving. I don't really understand that. I'm sure it's just something I don't know, but... Um, it is very strange. I'm gonna find my syringes so that I can see in the tubing if air is coming out. So that's what I'm gonna do now. And then once again, come back and uh, try and bleed this a little bit more, I think. 
Okay, I've got my syringe here and I'm just gonna fill the syringe up and shoot some fluid back through the whole brake system and then just bleed it a little bit and see if I can't get that bottom caliper to start moving. I don't really know why it's not moving, but to avoid messing anything up, I'm gonna put the bleed blocks in place. My understanding is that these are really there to prevent you from overfilling the whole system. So I think I could bleed it without them uh, and then just make sure I keep pushing the pistons back in place, but I'll put them in just because I'm not entirely sure if they serve another function aside from that. But um, yeah. All right, bleed blocks in place, uh, syringe. Um, I'm just gonna squeeze any air out of here. I probably showed all this in the bleeding video, but it was so long ago, I can't really remember. So yeah, now I'll leave the little stopper in so nothing leaks out. I'll take off the uh, bleed port And it immediately starts dripping out of there. There's still some air in here as well. You can see it. Okay. What I probably should do is read the exact procedure again, but basically you just need there to be no air in the system at all. So I'm gonna start by just shooting a little bit of the brake fluid through and see if any air comes out the top. I'm gonna pull it back through just and see if some air comes out the bottom now. And nothing really seems to be happening. Maybe a couple tappy taps on the caliper. It's probably obvious that I didn't read the exact procedure for this before I started this video. I'm gonna try holding the lever down and then pulling fluid through. I think that will cause more of a vacuum to develop. So hopefully that will pull any air out. And I am making a mess here. <laughs> oh man. But nothing, not much is happening except that I'm pulling air into my syringe. I think what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna do a, I'm gonna just double check how to actually bleed these brakes properly because I'm just guessing at it here and I think I'm not, I don't think I'm harming anything, but I'm probably not really helping anything here. So I think the prudent thing to do is say, I don't know what I'm doing and go back to the internet and uh, just double check how to bleed RX4 calipers. There's a video that Hope's done. That's what I referred to last time. And then we'll come back and actually bleed this stuff properly. Okay, well, I watched that Hope video and I think I just needed to kind of trust what I was doing because basically you're just pushing the fluid back and forth. It's, it's what I said that you just want to make sure there's no air in the system and the hope way of doing this is just pushing fluid back and forth. But I'm going to fill a little bit more into the funnel running a bit low here, but I do have plenty actually. I just um, need to make sure I don't drip too much on the ground. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the stopper out and I'm gonna just pull some fluid uh, through the funnel and into the syringe, push it back and do that a few times. And then the part that I missed from that video is then you hold the lever down and then you just pull on the syringe a little bit. And that's what I was doing when I thought I got air into the syringe from around the seals. But it turns out it could have been air coming out of the um, caliper that I just didn't notice had gone straight into the syringe. And then you kind of uh, release the brake lever slowly as you push the fluid back through. But first thing is just to kind of pull a little bit of the fluid uh, slowly back and forth. And yeah, a bit of air is immediately coming out. And I guess if some air is caught in the syringe, it's not the end of the world as long as my syringe is uh, being held so that the air floats to the top. But it was only a very, very small amount of air that just came out. And obviously I don't want to pull all the fluid out of the funnel, otherwise I'll introduce air from the top. And now I'm just going to push it back through again, very gently, very, very gently, because you just don't want to introduce air from anywhere, basically. Now I will pull the lever fully 
and now I'm going to try and pull slightly and see if any air comes out. And, you know, a little bit is coming out. I guess I had to pull harder than I thought. If I pull hard enough, a little bit of air does come out. All right, now I'm going to give the, lead, the caliper a couple tappy taps uh, just to maybe drive any other air up towards the bleed port. I don't know if that really makes a difference, but I just want to dislodge any possible air that's in there just to get it out of there because I want all these um, pistons to work, obviously. Uh, but let's just do that whole procedure one more time and see if more air does come out. And now I'll stop it. And I'm going to put in the uh, bleed port screw just to block that, uh, anything from getting in from there. Then I'll bleed the lever a little bit and I'll see if the brakes come up. I think this is where the bleed blocks come in because now I'm going to be pulling on this. You know, once those other three uh, calipers, pistons touched the bleed blocks, that fourth one came out. So they're all out now. Of course, they're not retracting. Let's just, oh, you know what? I forgot this again. I mean, the brakes feel good. Maybe they're fine. Maybe I just needed to get a bit of pressure on that bottom caliper just to get it to move. Uh, I'm going to take the bleed blocks out and reset the um, pistons and then see if they all move this time. And obviously, since the bleed port is open at the top, when you push the pistons back into place, they won't come back out again because you're pushing the fluid into the funnel. So that's what I'm doing here. So, you know, in theory, with the bleed blocks in place, like I kind of tried to explain a minute ago, that should set how far those pistons are apart when they're at rest. Uh, and when I thought that this system was overfilled, which I still think it was, unless... Maybe that sticky callip piston has something to do with it. Um, you know, that's a way of getting a little bit of fluid out of the system. You open up that bleed port, make sure there's a funnel there, and you can push some of push those um, pistons back out, and you'll take some fluid out of the system. So that's what I've done here. I'm now gonna, without bleed blocks, just pull that a little bit, and it's still only three calipers that are moving. How strange. Now I'm thinking that maybe this all just needs to settle a little bit and get used to the wheel being there. Oh crap. Something just dripped. But I think it was just, just some fluid that's on the caliper there. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna not use the bleed blocks. I'm just gonna, by eye, kind of set how far apart I think those pistons should be. Then we'll go reinstall the wheel and try the brakes with the wheel and the pads installed and then see what happens then. And maybe I didn't need to bleed anything. Maybe this was all fine. But I'll, I'll pull this a little bit, I think. You know, I think that, that piston is moving a little bit now, so maybe it'll be fine. Uh, so yeah, let's go ahead and close up this brake system. And I don't want to lose any fluid here, so I'll stop that. <laughs> I'm such a messy person. This is so hard for me to do this and keep, and keep everything clean. But I will try. Get a rag. Clean that. Clean this because you obviously don't want brake fluid on the pads themselves. Um, now I'm going to wash my hands, put the pads in, and put the wheel lock in and just kind of see what happens. Maybe I can actually try and reset the pistons now and see what they do. Oh yeah, they're just retracting. 
So they're all retracted now, which is kind of how they should be. Um, so I'm going to try this and we'll see if I have enough brake fluid in there. There is obviously a reservoir in here. Um, but yeah, let's go put the wheel in now. I mean, let's put the pads in and then put the wheel in. <laughs> okay guys, so I'm actually going to cut the video there. I had intended this episode to be one long video, but during editing, the video came out to be about an hour and 15 minutes long, which is just ridiculous. So I decided to break it up into two parts and this seemed like a good place to cut the video. So next week you'll see me centering the calipers around the brake rotors. I also bleed the rear brake. And finally I end up settling on the cable routing and tying all the brake hoses in place. So that's what's coming up next week. And then after that we get into the drivetrain. Actually, here's a sneak peek. I've got the drivetrain mostly installed there now. Um, but I hope you enjoyed this video. Thank you very much for watching um, and maybe I'll see you next week. Thanks. Have a great rest of your day.